Hello and welcome to Man's Model Moments. Uh, today I'm going to be looking at the second of the Unearthed Arcana releases for 1D&D from D&D Beyond. And this is the Expert Classes release. So this is a pretty long document and they go through uh, three of what they call the Expert Classes. The Bard, the Ranger and the Rogue. Uh, and they also put a bunch of feats and other stuff at the end. So I'm only going to look at the expert classes in this video, because otherwise it would just be massively long. Uh, and it's probably going to be long enough as it is. Let's have a look at the, the different expert classes and the changes that are proposed, because this is all playtest material, it's all Unearthed Arcana, for those three classes. Now, of course, this is the second release. So the first release covers some of the basics on player character generation, so player backgrounds, player race, uh, some of the core mechanics which are th they're thinking of changing. If you haven't seen that yet, I'll link it above uh, for you to have a look at. So I'm not going to be talking about any of that other than how it pertains to some of the characteristics uh, in these classes today. So the document starts uh, talking about expert classes and how they have divided all of the classes into class groups now. They have experts, mages, priests, and warriors. So the experts are what this particular UA is about, and covers bards, rangers, and rogues. Mages include sorcerers, warlocks, and wizards. Priests are clerics, druids, and paladins. And warriors are barbarian, fighter, and monk. So we're going to talk about any of those, because we don't know anything about those yet. This is purely on the experts. It also talks about artificers also being experts, but they're not covered in this because they're not in the player's handbook. So they do say that a class group has no rules in itself. So you think, well, why bother having groups? But it pertains to things like magical items or feats available only to a certain group. So actually, I think this is quite a good idea. So sort of categorizing the, the classes into sort of subgroups um, to enable that sort of broad brush approach. So let's talk about bards. So bards uh, make up, if you look at D&D Beyond Statistics, about 7% of single class characters. And the law bard, which is the only one described here, makes up about 59% of that. So it's about 4% of the overall single class, because this doesn't include multi-classes. So there are certain things with bards that, that haven't changed at all. I'm not going to talk about really the stuff that hasn't changed. So hit dice, armor, tools, saving throws skills are basically untouched. They're exactly the same as they are in the player's handbook. Uh, the first thing that changes is in their weapon proficiencies. So now it is only simple weapons. So bards lose access to hand crossbows, long swords, rapiers, and short swords. That immediately is going to cause a lot of consternation to a lot of bards losing rapiers, you know, which are far, by far away probably the best and most commonly used weapon for bards. And also, you know, hand crossbows, you're losing that. Uh, I've played a bard, he did use a hand crossbow, so that build would not be viable in 1D&D &D as it is presented at the moment. Fairly minor, though, uh, bards are not combat-oriented in that way, so this is a very minor impact. So let's get on to spellcasting. And this is where we come into the, the first of the big changes. So bards know four first-level spells from the bard spell list in addition to cantrips. This has changed now to the UA where you can prepare two zero level spells cantrips and two first level spells. And you can prepare any spell from the arcane list, but it must be from divination, enchantment, illusion, or transmutation. That is quite different, and we'll have to see, and the well, devil's in the detail here, and I don't really want to get into that level of detail here, but broadly speaking, those are going to be a similar set of spells. But the main thing is now that you can change those spells basically any time you take a long rest. That gives a lot more breadth to what you can you can have before bards were very limited in their numbers of spells. Is it a good or a bad thing? Uh, I'm not sure, really. Only being able to prepare two first level spells is quite restrictive for a first level character. Obviously, you can't cast many spells as a first level character, but unless you know what you're going to be facing, restricting it to just two is, you know, pretty narrow. Having said that, you know, broadening out the choice uh, of spells available when you take a, a rest does kind of counterbalance this. So this is a change. I don't know whether it's good or bad. I think it would really need, you know, actual playtesting um, side by side to be able to 
get the true impact of that. Now, of course, spellcasting ability is unchanged. Spellcasting focus is still a musical instrument, so that hasn't changed. Next, we come to bardic inspiration. So this is a core piece of the, the bard's mechanics. So in 5th you can inspire others. You can use a bonus action to give a d6 to somebody within 60 feet, and they can use it within the next 10 minutes. That now has changed to when another creature within 60 feet of you that you can see or hear fails a d20 test, you can use your reaction to give that creature your bardic inspiration die to use. That is actually quite a change in mechanic. I've got the feeling it reduces the utility of it. I mean, in combat, typically you might give somebody a bonus action inspiration and then you're going to do something. And then the next round you can do it again to somebody else. Using a reaction now means that uh, it happens at that time. What happens has to happen within 60 feet of you and that's used your reaction, so no opportunity attacks. So it's a change, for sure, and I'm not really sure what's driving it, because I don't see people on forums, and you know, certainly in my games, complaining about Bardic Inspiration. So why they've chosen to change something which isn't broken, I really don't know. However, you do get an extra ability with uh, Bardic Inspiration now, and that is Heal. So immediately after another creature within 60 feet of you that you can see or hear takes damage, you can use your reaction to roll your bard against inspiration die and restore a number of hit points to the creature equal to the number rolled. Now this is not the same as cutting words. So here you are actually restoring hit points. That potentially means that somebody could go down and you could restore hit points to them so they didn't. That is actually quite a good bonus ability, but it does change the flavour of the bard a little bit more to the healer. And you'll see a couple of pieces along the way here that also strengthen that, that feeling. So I'm not sure that's a change that people will embrace or not. Obviously bards are able to heal, but that, that's a minor ability of theirs. Those healing word desperation kind of uh, heals rather than you know a big healer like a life cleric. As far as the number of times that you can use Bardic Inspiration, that has also changed. Previously, obviously, it was linked to your Charisma modifier. Now it is related to your Proficiency bonus. I like the general idea of linking things to Proficiency bonus. I think restricting that... So that means you get two uses at first level. Whereas pretty much most builds are going to have at least a 16 Charisma as a bard at first level, so that's three uses, so that's nerfing that a little bit. I'm not quite sure how that is going to play out. I don't think it's going to make a massive difference, but again, it does feel like a little bit of a, a nerf. The actual dice for bardic inspiration haven't changed, nor when they actually increase in level. That is all staying the same. Jack of all trades, however, which previously you got at second level, you now don't get until fifth level. And again, I don't really see the point here. It was always only half of your proficiency bonus. So at second level, you're only getting plus one on things that you don't have proficiency in. Starting at fifth level, I mean, that's quite a, a number of levels that you're not getting that use where you could probably really use it. And bards are skill monkeys. And that seems to be taking away from that core piece of their ability. So not quite sure why uh, that has been done. Another big change is in the Song of Rest. So Song of Rest, previously when you took a rest, you could do a performance and everybody got extra hit points. You know, d6, d8, d10, d12, depending on level. Forget that. You do not get that ability at all anymore. That is gone. So now what you get is almost like cleric domain spells, you just get songs of restoration. So they're always prepared, so they're like domain spells. That doesn't count against the number of spells you can prepare. But you've still got to use your resources to cast those. That is a huge nerf, especially at low levels. Because before, if you did a arrest and people could regain hit dice and get these extra hit points, which were quite a lot. If you think you're rolling a D8 or even a D6 for your, your hit dice and you're getting an extra D6, that's a big deal, you know, at low levels. Now, 
No, uh, you always get healing words. And again, this kind of goes back into what I was saying about pushing it more into sort of a healer focus, but they don't really have the other abilities to back that up. And they're skill monkeys, so they're focused on doing other stuff. So pushing them into this kind of mono healing piece seems uh, a big change. I don't like it personally. I think if I had played a bard, that would kind of piss me off. Okay, now we go into Magical Inspiration, which is an optional rule in 5th E, so I'm not going to be too harsh on this. If a creature has Bardic Inspiration from you and casts a spell that restores hit points or deals damage, the creature can roll that die and choose a target affected by the spell and add to that um, effect. So it's a bit of bonus healing. That's kind of incorporated into the heal use of Bardic Inspiration now, sort of a part of it, but really it doesn't exist in this in this iteration. Uh, third level, you have to choose your Bard College. That is unchanged. And uh, now we go on to the level progression pieces. What happens at what level? So at third level, you've got to choose Expertise. This now happens at second level. Previously, you also got an additional uh, Expertise at 10th. That now happens at 9th. So that is a boost. So you're getting Expertise in a couple of proficiencies a level earlier, which covers a little bit some of the loss that you're getting from Jack of All Trades. So, but it's more specialised. And it was something you were getting already. You just have to wait a level for it. I'm not sure that's going to cover those low-level pieces. Ability score improvement is the same. Uh, that is unchanged in the, the new edition when, of course, now it's feats, uh, including the ability score feat. The Bardic Versatility option that you would have had previously, again, optionally in 50, where you can relearn a different spell. Uh, that's kind of replaced now, because obviously that doesn't exist because uh, you can change your spells up every rest anyway, so it really doesn't matter. I mean, for me, this takes a little bit of the flavour out of the bard, because now you can choose any spell. All bards get access to the same spells, basically. So for me, that is making it a little bit blander, um, you know, in the name of choice. So for me, good game design gives you difficult choices to make. Anything where you have a difficult or meaningful choice to make is a good thing and feels good. Good game mechanics where you feel that, you know, it's like, do I take this or do I take that? I really don't know. Now, it doesn't matter for your spells because all bards get the same. Essentially, from what this document is showing us so far, anything in the arcane list that falls in those specific groups, divination, enchantment, etc., you can prep. So it doesn't really matter what you've chosen. So for me, okay, gives you greater access to spells, but reduces the flavour of your character. It depersonalises it almost by making all of them able to do the same thing. Then we go to Font of Inspiration. That begins when you reach 5th level, and you regain all expended uses of Bardic Inspiration when you finish a short or long rest. That now happens at 7th level. So again, they've pushed that out a couple of levels. And uh, again, I don't really understand why that's been pushed out a couple of extra levels, especially when, you know, at lower levels, you really need those to come back. The other thing is they kind of balance down a little bit. Uh, so they made the ability a bit better because if a creature rolls your Bardic Inspiration and rolls a 1, after any re-rolls they might have, then the roll, the use of that Bardic Inspiration isn't expended. So basically, if you get a shit roll, you basically can ignore it. So you get a free point. It's it's not really very much. It's a tiny increase for quite a big decrease. Uh, on the whole, I prefer to have the unchanged ability at 5th level. Counter Charm. Obviously, in 5th edition at 6th level, you were able to produce a performance that would give people advantage on saving throws against being frightened or charmed. That's just gone. Just Nope, you don't get Counter Charm now. My party uh, in my current campaign has a bard, a law bard, who has used Counter Charm, which has been important in certain elements. They just wouldn't get this now. So that's uh, obviously just a straight nerf. And then we come to Magical Secrets. So Magical Secrets are where bards can basically choose spells from other spell lists. Here you got 5th edition, you got to do it at 10th, 14th and 18th level. Now... It only happens at 11th and 15th, so there's only two instances of Magical Secrets. But basically, now it's it's broader. So you can choose a spell list, Arcane, Divine, or Primal. 
And when you prepare spells, up to two spells, you prepare from the chosen list from any school of magic. That broadens what type of spell you can get a lot. And of course, you can change those on the rest. So you don't get as much, but you get access to a huge amount more spells. And again, I get the choice element, but again, it makes it feel less personalized. So why is my bard different from, you know, another player's bard? This this erodes that difference. So I don't know whether I, I really like that either, that flavor. And now at 20th level, you get superior inspiration in 5th edition. So this is where you roll initiative and don't have any uses of bardic inspiration. You gain one use of your bardic inspiration dice. This has been massively increased. So now this happens at 18th level, two levels before. And it's just when you roll initiative, so it doesn't matter if you don't have any left or not. If you still got some left, that's fine. But you regain two expended uses of your bardic inspiration. So that's really good. However, it's happening at such a late level. I mean, most players don't play above 14th, 15th level. Generally, most campaigns finish at that kind of level. So this, this higher level tier is a bit theory crafting because most people never get there. Most of the level 20 characters on D&D Beyond are people theory crafting. And the other difference now is that 20th level, instead of that um, superior inspiration, which you gained two levels before, you gain a boon, an epic boon, which of course is, again, a big increase. But again, who's playing 20th level characters? So this is going to affect very few people. So overall, you're getting quite a few nerfs in the class with a few little extra bonuses. Overall, I feel that bards have gone down a little bit, especially at lower levels. Um, and I don't really know why. So I feel that they've been reduced in power a little bit and made a bit more bland uh, in the name of giving them more choice. So let's specifically look now at the law bard. So when you join the college, you get proficiency with three skills of your choice and that, that is unchanged. And then you also get cutting words. So previously, when a creature within 60 feet of you makes an attack roll, an ability check or a damage roll, you can use your reaction to expend a bardic inspiration and reduce that from that number. When a creature you can see within 60 feet of you succeeds on an ability check or an attack roll, you can use your reaction to expend one of your uses of bardic inspiration, rolling bardic inspiration, dying, subtracting the number rolled from the creature's roll, potentially turning it into a failure. So you don't get to change damage now. So you can use it to heal as that reaction, because that, okay, so that's a core part of the mechanic now for a bard. So basically everybody kind of gets a bit of the cutting words with that heal piece kind of. So it's reduced the effectiveness of cutting words a little bit, but otherwise it's it's pretty much unchanged. Then we get the additional magical secrets. So Law Bards at sixth level get to learn an extra two spells from... that's just gone. You don't get that. Instead, what you get is cunning inspiration. Through your studies and your cunning, you've learn to inspire others exceptionally well. Basically, you just get to use essentially an advantaged inspiration dice. So you get to roll two dice and use the higher two rolls. That seems it's okay, but it's not great. What you do get, however, at 10th level, something that you weren't getting uh, before, is improved cutting words. Now, when you use cutting words on a creature, you get to deal psychic damage equal to that number plus your charisma modifier. That's pretty good. So cutting words now, you know, as well as potentially making another failure, you can also harm that creature. It's just a shame that that isn't also on the reducing damage. And at 14th level, you get peerless skill. So basically you can use bardic inspiration on yourself. In the UA, it is when you make an ability check and fail, you can expend one use of your bardic inspiration and add the number to your ability check. And if it fails... The Bardic Inspiration isn't expended. So that's much better. So basically you get a free use of your ins uh, Bardic Inspiration that you only use if it works. So that's kind of a really good ability. Uh, again, it's just a shame that it comes to 14th level uh, before you get, but that is definitely an increase in what you had before. Overall, the Bard is a real mixed bag. I would say, in this UA. And I don't really get what's driving a lot of the changes they've made. Uh, it seems to weaken the Bard at lower levels. 
sort of giving them a broader array of spells to choose from, um, but restricting what they can actually prepare. So if I was playing my bard and I had to change it into a one d and d bard, I wouldn't like it. I think the overall changes weaken the bard at lower levels and take away a lot of the the skill monkey generalist feel of bards into you know now you've got more expertise earlier on in you know a few things rather than a broad uh, area of expertise which you're not getting until seventh level which is you know that's mid levels not a big fan of the changes for bard now let's move to rangers now rangers have had a pretty checkered history in fifth e they're often regarded debated as being one of the weaker classes, especially some subclasses there. This deals with the Hunter, which is the, the top chosen subclass of Ranger, about 58%, so again, about 4% of the overall single class uh, PCs out there. So similar, very similar to the Lawbard. A whole bunch of stuff hasn't changed. The hit dice, armor, weapons, tool proficiencies, saving throws and skills are all exactly as they were in 5th edition. Now the biggest change straight up is rangers now get spell casting at level one not level two the other thing is they get cantrips so they get two cantrips and two first level spells at level one any spell you can prepare must be a primal spell from any school of magic except evocation and those refresh on a long rest where you can replace those spells with any other primal spell which isn't evocation in exactly the same way so again we're seeing the same thing that Anybody is allowed to take any spell that they're allowed to take each time they take a long rest. Make of that what you will. You'll either like it or you don't. That is one of the major changes in 1D&D and &D the way that spell preparation is, is being done as far as I can see so far. Now, the number of spell slots they get hasn't really changed much. Apart from the fact they get cantrips, they now get a couple of first level spells at the beginning. And then the spell progression is basically exactly the same as it was in 5th e. So they haven't added a whole bunch of spells. They've basically made it that you get two at first, two at second, three at third and fourth, and then it's 4-2, four, and exactly the same progression as in 5th e. So you're not getting a lot more, you're just getting it earlier. Uh, your spellcasting ability is still wisdom. The spellcasting focus, which was optional in 5th e, is now a requirement. You can use a druidic focus. Well, not a requirement, but it's just in the core rules that you can use a druidic focus rather than using material components. Then we get into the changes. And this really, it feels like a flavor change for the ranger. So essentially they've done away with a lot of the stuff dealing with the terrain, if I can take it like that. Rather now than ranger feeling like, you know, somebody based in nature who knows terrain and stuff, all of that is gone. I'm not gonna go through all the different iterations of what's happened with ranger. So I'm just using the, the straight up player's handbook versions. Favoured enemy. So we all know favoured enemy. You basically get advantage on wisdom survival checks to track them, intelligence checks to recall about them. You can also learn the language of your choice spoken by your favoured enemies, if they speak one. It's one of those abilities that either comes in a lot or not at all in campaigns. Uh, a lot of campaigns aren't outside, uh, aren't based in the wilderness or based in a different type of terrain. So this has been one of those things that's been debated a lot, which is why Favoured Enemy also has an option. The description now is you are adept at focusing your ire on a single foe. You always have the Hunter's Mark spell prepared, and it doesn't count against the number of spells you can prepare. Moreover, and this is a good bit, you don't have to concentrate on the spell once you cast it. It lasts for its full duration, and you can end it as a bonus action, or until you're incapacitated. So... This is non-concentration Hunter's Mark. It's not for free, so you still have to cast it. You still have to use, and you've only got two spell slots. You've only got three all the way up until fifth level, but you've always got it. This is quite a big boost, I think, at lower levels, and you know, not requiring concentration is great. So basically, unless you're incapacitated, you can go ahead and use Hunter's Mark all the time. But again, it is quite a flavor departure. Now you're kind of a, you know, a focused hunter. Uh, and this isn't the hunter subclass, this is just rangers. Next up in 5th E, you have Natural Explorer. You can just forget about all of that, because that's gone. That just doesn't exist at all. So again, 
what I mean about the flavor of them changing now, because this was, you know, you had a favored terrain, you couldn't be uh, slowed in that terrain, all that kind of stuff. Forget it, that's all gone. What you do get instead is expertise. And again, this kind of calls back to this grouping. So experts now all get expertise. And at first level, you get expertise in two skill proficiencies. You can have, you know, expertise in survival. So you could be an expert uh, tracker or whatever, which is quite a good feeling, I think. I just don't know why they've taken away all of the kind of stuff based on... I mean, if you wanted to make Aragorn, it's kind of a little bit difficult to see that in here. So it's that sort of flavour piece is, is almost missing uh, and the focus. But mechanically, that's quite good. Next up, fighting style. A little bit of a nerf here in that uh, basically you get exactly the same apart from you can only choose archery, defense, or two-weapon fighting now, uh, whereas you had a, a bigger range in 50. Whether that will expand or change in future, I'll we'll have to see. But it's a small nerf. It's not really much. Primeval Awareness, uh, third level. You can use your action, expend one ranger spell slot to focus your awareness on the region around you, and then you can tell whether types of creatures are present. Gone. Again, that flavor piece of that kind of, you know, your familiarity with the environment and tracking and that is all just gone. Forget all of that. If you if that's what turned you on about rangers, rangers are no longer for you. Ranger Enclave, obviously choosing that at third level, that is unchanged. But the martial versatility, which was an option at every level that allowed you an ASI, you could also change your fighting style, you know, reflecting that you know change in how you've been fighting. That that's just gone. Uh, extra attack at fifth level, unchanged. Land stride. Uh, which started at 8th level, uh, and now it has changed to an ability called Roving, which happens at 7th level, so it happens a little bit earlier. And again, this is a bit of a flavour change. So it's mechanically simpler now. So Roving, your speed increases by 10 feet while you're not wearing heavy armour, and you also have a climb speed and a swim speed equal to your speed, which I kind of get, but what if you were a ranger in the forest and didn't have really you know big pools of water why would you have a swimming speed so again a bit of a flavor departure but mechanically it's you know it's good landstride had you moving through non-magical difficult terrain costing no extra movement now that obviously applies to a lot of different circumstances including dungeons and things where difficult terrain is imposed by you know rocks and stuff or whatever terrain not magical but non-magical so it's broadly applicable whereas increasing your speed by 10 feet you've got difficult terrain okay you could have moved 15 feet as a normal character as a ranger you could have moved 30 feet through that and now with extra 10 feet of movement your speed is likely if you're human say 40 feet so you're going to be moving 20 feet because that difficult terrain is still going to affect you so you know it's, it's different that's that's basically the, the take home is this is a very different ability also you could have passed through non-magical plants without being slowed them without taking damage from them so thorns spines and all that didn't affect you whereas now of course it will uh, in addition you have advantage on saving throws against plants that are magically created or manipulated so you don't have any of that so now entangle is as likely to affect you as any other character so again it kind of takes away from the flavor of what a ranger was so the, it, this is kind of ranger reimagined now what you do get at eighth level now is another set of expertise you gain two more expertises and proficiencies of your choice now fifthly you had an ability at 10th level called hide in plain sight where you could spend a minute camouflaging yourself so this is where you go full rambo and you know get all this stuff or arnie and predator rubbing mud all over yourself to camouflage yourself and gaining plus 10 to dexterity stealth checks that's that's gone but it's kind of replaced now by your 13th level ability which we'll come to shortly in the ua now you also get an ability at the 11th level called tireless and this is really good primal forces now help fuel you on your journeys granting you the following benefits you get temporary hit points whenever you finish a short or long rest, which are equal to 1d8 plus your proficiency bonus. And you can also decrease exhaustion. If you're exhausted when you finish a short rest, you can reduce your level of exhaustion by one. That is massive. I mean, that's the same as a greater restoration for free. That's, that's a really, really good ability. Uh, exhaustion is a horrible 
crippling, debilitating effect in 5th E. Being able to just get rid of it on a short rest, fantastic. Now, at 13th level, you get Nature's Veil, and this kind of incorporates some of the Hide in Plain Sight and the Vanish that you would get at 14th level in 5th E, where you could use a Hide as a bonus action, um, and you can't be tracked by non-magical means uh, unless you choose to leave a trail. 13th level, Nature's Veil, you invoke spirits of nature to magically hide yourself from view. As a bonus action, you can expend a spell slot and become invisible until the end of your next turn. So this, on, on the face of it, you think, fantastic, you can turn invisible. It's only until the end of your next turn. So think of think of something like a, a Furbolg that gets that ability naturally. You're getting this at 13th level, and you're not able to do any of the stuff that you could do in 5th E. So you can still be tracked by non-magical means. You can't use the hide as a bonus action. You can't camouflage yourself and get plus 10 to, to dex checks. So it seems like a very short term. Oh, plus, of course, you have to spend a spell slot. And again, it, it just, it's a different feel. So now you are a bit of a more of a magical nature warrior. Although the connection with nature is really not there. Next up is feral senses. So at fifth year, you would get this 18th level. You're now getting this at 15th level, so full three levels earlier. It is a little bit different. So just in the terms of the wording, at 18th level, when you attack a creature, you can't see your inability to see it doesn't impose disadvantage on your attack rolls against it. You're also aware of the location of any invisible creatures within 30 feet of you, provided the creature isn't hidden from you and you aren't blinded or deafened. Now, they've simplified that into you get blind sight of 30 feet. Okay. Which I think is, is a fair simplification of it, but you're getting at three levels earlier, so that's a big boost, really, to that ability. Now, the capstone ability of the base ranger is Foe Slayer at 20th level. You can add your wisdom modifier to the attack roll or damage of basically anything you make against one of your favoured enemies, and that's once on each turn. You're now getting that ability at 18th level, so you get it earlier, but I have to say. <laughs> Hunter's Mark now does a D10 instead of a D6. So an average of 5.5 instead of 3.5. So an average of two points more. And you're still having to use Hunter's Mark. Whereas before it was basically an ability where you could just use it. I get you getting it earlier, but it seems really weak. 20th level, again, you get an epic boon. That's common amongst all of these. This is a reflavoring of the Ranger into a nature magic hunter kind of thing rather than somebody connected to the land it doesn't seem to have that flavor okay so now let's look at the hunter at third level you got to choose one of the features of from colossus slayer giant killer or horde breaker they've done away with that entirely and now you just get to add a d8 extra damage if a target is missing any of its hit points now that's pretty big that's a pretty big increase in damage, especially at, at third level, and you're doing it on every hit that you're using with attack action. So when you get multi-attack, that's going to apply to all of those. An extra d8 on each of those hits. That's pretty strong, and it's pretty bland. It doesn't have that feel, uh, and it doesn't have that customization. It's just you get to do an extra d8. So it feels a bit boring. Now, at sixth level you get an extra ability called Hunter's Law. Here you can call on the forces of nature to reveal certain strengths and weaknesses of your prey. When a creature is marked by Hunter's Mark, so that's an interesting proviso, so you have to have Hunter's Mark already cast, so it's already requiring a cast spell. You know whether that creature has any immunities, resistance, and vulnerabilities. If the creature has any, you know what they are. So that's a good ability to have, but the prerequisite, the fact it's at level six and the fact that as i'll show you in a minute you lose on defensive tactics i'm not sure it's a good trade so this is all good stuff to know but i don't know whether if i was given the choice of trading this ability at six level or defensive tactics at seven whether i'd go for this because the fifth the defensive tactics is now gone so you can't do escape the horde multi-attack defense or steel will those just don't exist so this is effectively the replacement for those. You get the Hunter's Law. I think that's not a great trade. Multi-attack you're now gaining at 10th level. <laughs> but again, this has been 
Uh, I think this is horrible, actually. So in 5th at 11th level, you would get multi-attack. And that would allow you to either do volley or whirlwind attack. So you could, if you're a ranged character, you could make an attack against a number of different creatures within 10 feet of a point. Whirlwind attack, you could make melee attacks. So it, it worked for different builds. You don't get that now. You do get the ability one level earlier, so now it's at 10th level. So 10th level, multi-attack. You now always have the Kanja Barrage spell prepared, and it doesn't count against the number of spells you can prepare. <laughs> it's like, oh, but you can also cast it at lower levels with first and second level spell slots as well as third, but the spell's damage is reduced by 1d8 for each slot below third. That is, for me, a very, very poor trade. Uh, from the prior multi-attack. So for me, it doesn't work. I mean, that's pushed really into a range build more. And yeah, not not a fan. Then at 15th level, you had Superior Hunter's Defense, which basically gave you a choice. Again, Evasion, Stand Against the Tide, or Uncanny Dodge. Now it happens at 14th level, so it happens a, a level earlier. Uh, but basically you get Evasion. It's, it's an improved Evasion because you reduce the... You use your reaction to half the attack's damage and redirect the other half of the damage to one creature other than the attacker that's within five feet of you. So if you're fighting a single target, you just get evasion, or if that target is you know more than five feet away from you. So it's a bit circumstantial. 14th level, you don't get the choice. So previously, 5th edition, you would have had three Hunter's Prey options, with three defensive tactics options, with two multi-attack options, and three superior hunter's defense options. Eleven options. I've run out of fingers. Eleven options. Here, there is one. That, to me, is the wrong direction. You know, everywhere else, you know, the spells and everything, it's like, oh, you can choose whatever you like. Here, this is what you get. So it's a reflavoring of the ranger. It, for me, doesn't feel like a ranger anymore. It feels very much just like a hunter. And that connection with with different lands and stuff, which could have been done better, for sure, because it mechanically wasn't very good and, you know, often didn't come up in play. So there's a lot of homebrew stuff. I don't want to get into all of that, but Instead, they've just ditched all of that. Rather than trying to fix those, they've ditched all of that and just focused on these very simple mechanical fixes, which, okay, they produce a range of sorts, but very monopurposed, um, very singular, and for me, a little a little flavourless. The ranger, I think, I commend that they've approached it fresh, but I don't really like most of what they've done. I think the spell casting at level one is a good idea. Having cantrips is a good idea. But all of the rest of this, uh, well, expertise as well, I think is a good idea. The rest of it, I think, really needs to be re-looked at. So finally, we come to Rogue, the second most popular single-class PC on D&D Beyond. 11% of players play Rogues. Most of those... About 40%, I think it is, 39%, play Thieves, which is the subclass that they deal with in the UA. So again, it's about 4.3, 4.4% of all players. So similar to the other two, uh, but Thieves are iconic. They're quite strong in 5th E. They're glass cannons. I've played a number of Rogues. I really like Rogues. This does change some fundamentals of them, which I think is going to be quite divisive. Uh, for people. Simple stuff to start with. Hit dice, unchanged. Armor, unchanged. Here comes the first one. Weapons. Now, again, I applaud the thought behind this, because what they've done is said they now have proficiency in simple weapons and martial weapons that have the finesse property. So that's rapier, scimitar, short sword, and whip. I think the scimitar and the whip make absolute sense. I think it was odd that they weren't included in 5th E, or that they weren't finesse weapons. However, there's a couple of things that that does exclude. Longswords, which are neither here nor there because I don't know anybody that uses longswords as a rogue. And the big one, hand crossbows. No hand crossbows. So if you had a ranged rogue before based around hand crossbow, sorry, it ain't going to work. So 
I don't think that's going to be a particularly welcome change for most people. Tools, saving throws, skills and expertise are all exactly the same as 5th E. And then we come to the second big change, which again, I think is going to be extremely divisive. Even if mechanically it may not make too many differences, sneak attack. Everybody knows how sneak attack works. If you don't, basically, if you have advantage on the attack or you've got a colleague within five feet who isn't incapacitated, you don't have disadvantage on that roll, then you get to roll a number of extra damage dice of the same damage type as you, the weapon you're using. Most of that is exactly the same. The devil here is in the wording. In fifth edition, once per turn, you can deal an extra, you know, however many sneak attack damage, to one creature you hit with an attack, if you have and all those bits. Those are the important things. Once per turn, not necessarily your turn, so this is where you can do multiple sneak attacks in a round, because somebody else's turn can provoke an opportunity attack and you can use a sneak attack on that. You can deal an extra 1d6 damage to one creature you hit with an attack. Okay, so those are the two important pieces to remember there. Wording in the UA. Once on each of your turns, so now it's only your turn, when you take the attack action, so just to really specify it down, so this is no more multiple sneak attacks. You get a sneak attack when you take the attack action. So that is a change that is going to displease a lot of rogues. <laughs> and then all of the same restrictions as existed in 5th E. But just those subtle word differences take it from something that, if you were lucky, and it had to be lucky, right? This didn't happen most of the time. But a rogue could position themselves so that if they provoked opportunity attacks, that they would be able to get sneak damage. And that was pretty important in control. Board control um, is a big piece of 50. If you don't know that, then you need to think about how you're playing the game. Provoking opportunity attacks... You know, rogues don't want to be in the front line, but if they do get in the front line, they can be really good about controlling that, because if people start trying to move away from them without disengaging, you can clean up an area quickly. This removes that entirely. Other pieces, Thieves' Cant, Cunning Action, Ruggish Archetype, all completely unchanged. The optional Steady Aim is now gone. That's just not a part of it anymore. Uh, ability score improvements happen in exactly the same positions. Uncanny Dodge evasion, reliable talent, then changed. One thing that they do now get, um, in addition to prior additions, is a 13th level ability called Subtle Strikes. When you attack, you know how to exploit a target's distraction. You have advantage on any attack roll that targets a creature that is within five feet of at least one of your allies isn't incapacitated. That is also the same criteria for getting sneak attacks. So this basically almost guarantees sneak attack if you're attacking somebody within five feet of, of one of your allies. That's really good. So whether this is trying to balance out that, that prior one, but that's a really strong ability. It comes in at 13th level, though. Did rogues need to be stronger at high levels? Because at high levels, rogues get pretty good. And I'm not really sure they needed to get advantage because they're already doing things like hiding. They've already got, because of reliable talent and great stealth roles, they already have ability to like hide behind things with their cunning action. Um, and gain advantage on an attack roll anyway. So it's strong, but I'm not sure it's needed. The old ability at 14th level, where you've got blind sense, however, is gone. So you might be getting advantage on things that you can see next to your allies, but if somebody sneaks up on you, you can't attack them. Slippery Mind at 15th level is now improved because it affects both wisdom and charisma saving throws. So before it was only wisdom saving throws, now it's wisdom and charisma. That's really good. Elusive, which you gained at 18th, is now gained at 17th. And Stroke of Luck, which is your capstone 20th level ability, is now gained at 18th level. Previously, if your attack missed a target within range, you can turn that miss into a hit. Or if you fail an ability check, you can treat the d20 as a 20. Now it applies to any d20 test. So now you're also talking about saves too. So that has, again, it's lowered the barrier to it by bringing it down to 18th and increased the effect of it. Really strong ability. It's high level, 
and I don't know really who's playing at these kind of levels, and I don't really know if they really need to be stronger. So all of this seems a bit odd, that these strong abilities are coming in at the high levels of play, whether they're trying to encourage people to play at a high level, I don't know. And then, of course, at 20th level, you get the epic boon. All strong abilities. So there's a couple of things which are going to annoy people. Loss of hand crossbows, changes to sneak attacks, so it's only basically once on your turn. But then, once you get at higher levels, you've got some nice strong abilities, although you are losing a couple of others as well. So it's difficult to know, really. Now, in terms of the thief specifically, uh, there are a few things. Third level, you have fast hands. Starting at third level, you can use your bonus action, granted by your cunning action, to make a dexterity sleight of hand check. Use your thieves' tools to disarm a trap or open a lock, or take the use an object action. You get basically advanced options for your cunning action, which you can do the following. Search, take the search action. Sleight of hand, make a dexterity check to pick a lock or disarm a trap with thieves' tools, or to pick a pocket. So just the two. You don't get to use an, option, use an object now. Second story work. Again, this differs slightly in the nuance of the wording. When you choose this archetype, you gain the ability to climb faster than normal. Climbing no longer costs you extra movement. In addition, when you make a running jump, the distance you cover increases by a number of feet equal to your dexterity modifier. So if you could jump 10 feet, in your dex of 20, you can now jump 15 feet. That has changed now into you get a climb speed equal to your speed. Now that is slightly different climbing no longer costing you extra movement and some of the subtlety comes in how it, how it's applied but I, I get why they've done it it's a simplification. When you take the jump action you can make a dexterity check instead of a strength check. Now that I think is quite a quite a good thing but it also doesn't let you make <laughs> jumps that you could make in 50. So it's an easier check to make now, but you can't jump as far, whereas before it would have been a harder check, but you could jump further. I think it makes sense actually making dex check instead of a strength check rather than being able to jump further, but obviously it is a mechanical change. Thieves also get Supreme Sneak and use Magic Device, so there are a couple of differences here. Supreme Sneak, which at ninth level you have an advantage on dexterity checks if you move no more than half your speed in a turn. Uh, that is changed now to you have advantage on every dex check stealth you make, provided you aren't wearing medium or heavy armor. That's quite a bit different. Okay, so there's no penalty really, because, well, you can't wear medium or heavy unless you're multiclassing. So, wow, now you just get advantage on stealth checks automatically. Uh, whereas before, you, know, you had to actually move half speed to do it. I mean, mechanically, it works fine. Um, again, it's probably just a little bit of flavour. Use Magic Device at 13th level. Basically, in 50, you ignore class, race, and level requirements on the use of magic items. In the UA, it's, it's a little bit different. I think it's stronger. It's the same kind of general feel and premise. So there are different effects now with this use of magic. Attunement. You can attune up to four magic items at once. That is huge, just by itself. The ability to attune to an extra magic item is a huge deal, especially when you're up at these sort of levels. Because at 13th level, you've probably accumulated quite a lot of stuff. So the ability to attune to another magical item is not arguably game-breaking, but it's very, very strong. Um, charges. Whenever you use a magic item property that expends charges, roll a d6. On a roll of 6, you use the property without expending the charge. That is also very, very good. Scrolls. You can use any spell scroll that bears a cantrip on a, or a first level spell. You can also try to use any spell scroll that contains a higher level spell, but you must first succeed on an intelligence check with a DC equal to 10 plus the spell's level. That, that's all fine. But overall, I think that is a much stronger ability than previously. So 17th level thieves have thieves' reflexes. And here you can take two turns during the first round of any combat. Take your first turn at normal initiative, your second turn during your initiative, minus 10. You can't use this feature when you are surprised. Firstly, instead of 17th level, this happens at 14th level. So full three levels earlier. But the flavour it is is a little different, and I think it's weaker. It happens at 14th. So now you can take a second bonus action on your turn, provided it is the bonus action from cunning action. 
You can use this feature on a number of turns equal to your proficiency bonus, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. So again, I like the fact it's like linked to proficiency bonus, but if you think about it, an extra bonus action that you're going to use cunning action. So essentially what this does is you normally get your action, your bonus action, your cunning action, and your reaction. And now essentially you're getting your action, bonus action, cunning action, and reaction. What else are you going to use that bonus action for? So thieves don't have that much in terms of bonus actions outside of the cunning action, which specifically allows you to do things. You know, they're not casting a lot of spells, even, and this is thieves, okay? So you're not casting any spells. You've got a bonus action magical item, maybe, but most bonus actions are linked to spell casters, typically, outside of cunning actions. So what is this actually giving you? It happens, okay, 14th, it's fairly high, now compare that to two actions on your first round of combat, each combat. I would prefer to have two rounds in each combat, to be honest, even if I have to wait to 17th to do it. Because despite it happening at 14th and having three levels to, to use my extra bonus action, in the, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it. You know, I can't bonus action dash, that's my cunning action. So what is it giving me over and above what I already have? There are probably a very few very niche circumstances that I could use that. Whereas two turns on the first round of combat? Hell yeah. <laughs> that is far more useful. So that is the, if you like, the blow-by-blow -blow account of each of the expert classes. A few takeaways, I think. The expert class and groups are a good idea in general. I, I like the way that they're categorizing things now with arcane, primal, divine spells. They've got these different class groups. I think that's, that's nice. That's good game design. But when you get down into the detail of the changes they've made to each of the classes and the subclasses, I think it's a really mixed bag. And I'm not really sure they're terribly well thought through. And that a lot of these make a huge amount of sense. You would really have to play test this a lot. And feedback is only open on this till the 20th of October. And realistically, I think if you played every day with one of these classes, so that's seven days of testing each, you're not really going to be able to get all of the nuance out of the changes because they've made so many changes, some positive, some negative, that I really don't know what they're going for, especially with the Ranger, where they really reflavored it. The Bard, they seem to have weakened in early levels. There does seem to be a general push in power for the high levels, which, from what I've seen, from my experience, my current campaign party averages around level 13, 14. They're pretty strong, so I wouldn't have said a power boost is needed there. So support at the low end, I would have thought, is more important when people are just getting into the game and you want to make sure they stay in the game. So I'm not quite sure really what all of this looks like in reality and what it all means uh, as i say it's a really mixed bag anyway the ua is available for download from dnd beyond i suggest you go have a look at it yourself maybe try out some of these builds see what you think see how they actually perform in your games and give that feedback back to wizards of the coast because what we say will shape the next iteration of the game and that's what it will take, the players to actually give their feedback um, from really trying out these classes and you know, hopefully making sure that they make some good choices and some of the anomalies or you know, weaker or OP builds that they've got here don't come through to the final game. That's all for this instalment of Man's Model Moments. Please like, subscribe and share this video if you enjoyed it. It's the best way of helping me to grow the channel and produce more content like it. With that... I hope you have plenty of modelling moments of your own, and I look forward to welcoming you on the next video.